Hey everybody, Stephanie Claremont here with you, registered dietitian, the founder of stephanieclaremont.com and the Clarity Program. This is the Relief Report and our very first episode of the new version of Relief Report, which has been a newsletter we have emailed out to, I think our list is about 7,000, 8,000 readers every single week for the past five years maybe. Um, and we've turned our lovely Relief Report into a live Facebook show so that we can come to you every week, discuss, answer any questions or comments, and talk to you and bring you the latest, greatest information about how to keep you feeling well, help you relieve symptoms of digestive distress, whether you're suffering from IBS, that's irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel diseases like Crohn's or colitis, or any other digestive disorder or disease. The team and I are preparing a really cool show that I don't think you'll be able to find on the internet or on the web right now specifically for you, the digestive health sufferer, uh, someone who is either dealing with symptoms, trying to get rid of them still, or someone who is well, trying to keep well um, with the diagnosis of IBS or IBD. So today is our first episode. The way this show is going to work is it's just like a news show. So Alita can hear me and see me. Thanks, Alita. Um, where we're going to bring you the latest of research, um, things going on in the media and pop culture, as well as any changes to the low FODMAP diet or any of the dietary therapies um, used that are helpful for digestive health issues. So today we have three stories that I'm going to bring you and I do have notes so I can make sure that I'm accurate with everything that we're sharing with you. And remember, all of the content, all of the strategies, everything here on the Relief Report is to help you feel absolutely well. And if you need any more help or any more information, then you can learn more about the Clarity Program on my website, stephanieclaremont.com, if you want a little more of a system to follow and some support as you actually get through this process and feel a lot better and get back to feeling like normal. So today, let's start with um, differences in bacteria are linked to changes in brain structure in those with IBS. So this is a study that we came across published in just May of this year, that's 2017, in Microbiome, which is a journal, and it's called The Differences in Gut Micro Microbial Composition, Microbial, sorry, Composition Correlate with Regional Brain Volumes in IBS. Okay, long title. Basically, what they found in this study is they looked at psychological evaluations, stool samples, brain imaging for 29 adults, and 23 healthy controls, so those with IBS and those, with, um, those without IBS. And what they found was really interesting. So individuals with IBS had differences in the gut microbiome. So when we talk about the gut microbiome, we're talking about the bacteria that lives in the digestive system. Now, if you're just tuning in, we're heading into our very first story for our Relief Report show today. And um, you're very welcome to say, hi, always love to see who's here live. Any comments or questions you have, let me know. Um, so what they found was individuals with IBS had differences in the gut microbiome, which is that bacteria that lives in our digestive system. We have a small amount in the, in the small intestine and then a larger amount in the colon, which is the large intestine. And we all kind of have different amounts and variations and strains. Um, so this is a cool area that research is coming out more and more on and, you know, is trying to help us understand how we can change the gut microbiome for the better to help us um, heal and, and deal with less symptoms. So there was differences in the gut microbiome, that's bacteria living in the gut, compared to controls between those healthy individuals and those with IBS. There were differences in brain structure between those that were healthy individuals and those with IBS, and that included the area of the brain involved in pulling together sensory information was bigger in those with IBS, and we've heard that potentially some of the causes of those of us with IBS, and remember, I'm someone who's diagnosed with IBS as well, 10 years ago in 2007, um, that we are more sensitive to the things that are happening in our body. So regular foods that are very easily fermented, things like beans that are fermented in most people and can cause and trigger digestive symptoms. For those of us with IBS, we're more sensitive to that feeling, that sensation of bloating and distension and discomfort and gas. So they're showing that in the brain that those with IBS have a larger <clears throat> area of the brain to pull together sensory information, so that might be a connection. And the area of the brain involved in dealing with emotions and cognitive functions were smaller in those with IBS. 
so what does that mean? What can we pull from that, that the area of our brain that has to deal with emotions and cognitive function is smaller? So can we cope with emotions not as well? Do we need to work on improve those coping mechanisms and strategies to deal with day-to-day -day stresses? Now, based on the psychological assessment with IBS, those of us with IBS were more likely to experience trauma, which then could influence brain development and have some influence on the gut bacteria. So this is the whole point of why I want to talk about this study today. With the psychological assessment, so sitting down talking to these participants, there was some indication of trauma in the past and that that potentially could lead to what we're seeing here. Um, the brain development and how, you know, what we just talked about and the differences between those with IBS and those healthy. And number two, not just brain development, but also in the gut bacteria, in the microbiome, having more or less of different kinds of bacteria. Now, we don't have what kinds of bacteria here in this study, but what that could mean is that some bacteria actually ferment foods a lot more than other bacteria. So you could have changes in your microbiome where I have more of those bacteria that ferment and then my digestive system would make more gas, would cause more bloating, could have more you know, changes in stool opposed to someone that doesn't have the bacteria that ferments more. So that could be you know, what we're talking about in changes to microbiome. But what could be the potential cause is trauma. And so I think that's very interesting because right now you know, researchers aren't going to tell us really you know, what causes IBS. Uh, what causes these digestive health issues, it's really kind of out there and there's just potential causes. But what this kind of brings us together to talk about is if many of us with IBS actually have gone through trauma in our past. And it's a sensitive subject, I know. And if you aren't going to raise your hand here and comment publicly that you've gone through trauma, that is absolutely fine. I'm not asking you to do that. But I'm asking you to kind of reflect on that and understand that, you know, sometimes when things happen to us, we wonder why, we wonder why us, and for a lot of us, we potentially have gone through trauma. And that could be as a child, that could be as a teenager, that could be, you know, all kinds of times in our lives. I can tell you personally, when I was diagnosed with IBS, I had just been away um, in Australia, and I live in Canada, so that is on the other side of the planet, for four months. And I thought it would be fun, I'd live on the beach, and it was fun, and I met lots of cool people, and I lived on the beach. But it was, you know, quite an emotional roller coaster for me and very, very tricky and challenging and a lot emotionally went on there. I had a couple of anxiety attacks while I was there and I experienced, I don't know if I would call that trauma, but a lot of my clients over the years have talked about when the onset of IBS happened, it was related to uh, something that happened. It could have been a loss of a loved one or a pregnancy and birth of a little one. Um, could be change in job or a sickness or an illness as well. Something kind of threw their system off. So, you know, what has thrown your system off if you reflect back on when things kind of happen? And also, was there some kind of trauma that happened? You know, was there something in your life that, you know, heartbreaking to think about? You know, I, I know that when I think back, there was some hard things that I went through as a child. Could that have moved us forward into this area of having digestive issues? Now, where does that leave us? Just because we're identifying why things happen doesn't mean now we're left alone with all of these awful and frustrating symptoms. And as someone who has moved past those and is now living a more comfortable, normal life where my symptoms are under control, it is my absolute mission to help you and everyone out there who's still suffering. So one of the things we want to talk today about is belly breathing and how that could ease IBS symptoms. So can we just use some really simple strategies to relieve our symptoms and feel a heck of a lot better? The team and I think that we can. So there's this actually published in um, media, it's a media newspaper article in Express UK and it's about belly breathing and how it can relieve symptoms. So um, there's a health writer that wrote this article and the team and I, uh, we, we've talked a lot about breathing, different kinds of breathing and even in the Clarity program, which we deliver to clients, um, in the first phase, the relief phase, where you go through seven weeks of strategies each week working on something to improve your health, we have a whole section on the mind gut connection where we talk about breathing. So we are big believers in adding some simple strategies in besides changing your diet, you know, going beyond FODMAPs or beyond the diet to make changes that are really going to help improve your symptoms. So because of the mind gut connection, mindfulness techniques can help relieve symptoms according to this particular um, mindfulness expert. And she suggests taking a few minutes out of your day to meditate to help ease emotional tension and rebalance the system. Now, there are a plethora of studies 
on the mind gut connection. So how our mind, how our brain, how our thoughts and emotions are directly related to how we have symptoms in that stress and anxiety and negative feelings can actually speed up the motility of your gut. There's a physiological action. So I'm not telling you your symptoms are in your head. I would never say that to you, but we've all been told that and it's not true. It's not in our head, but our thoughts and emotions are directly related to how we feel and how our digestive system actually works. So when we have that, you know, emotional response or we have a stressful response or things are going on, we're just kind of pushing it deep down inside, that can really lead to a worsening of symptoms. So what we're talking about here, what this mindfulness is talking about is something that we definitely agree with. And my team is that taking a few minutes to actually connect to your body and, and do some mindfulness can really help. So here are the tips from the mindfulness expert. Create, create a toolkit. So items that you can bring with you on the go that help you relax. I love this. So things like essential oils and tea, something that we've been using in my family for the last six months, I'd say, is lavender oil. One, it smells wonderful. Two, it's super calming. You can rub it on your hands. You can rub it like behind your ears. I love doing that, especially if I'm going to go to like a yoga or meditation class. Or opposite, I'm going to go have to do something super stressful. Maybe I'm going to go in the car for an hour. I never go in the car. So car for the hour is a long time, um, you know, or whatever you have to do or whoever you have to deal with, you know, putting some lavender oil behind your ears and then you kind of, you can smell it. It's so, so nice. Um, and it smells good. So people smell you and be like, ooh, what's that wonderful scent? It's a calming essential oil. So having some things like that that help to calm you, maybe having some peppermint tea or other things that actually help to relax you, anything like that can help when you're out in the world to take a few minutes to kind of calm and ground yourself. Belly breathing is what this particular expert talks about, and we actually teach this in our program as well, so we love this. So belly breathing is gonna be lying down, placing both hands on your tummy, covering your belly button, and then breathing deeply all the way into your diaphragm, and then breathing out. So you're breathing deeply, all the way into your belly and you're feeling it rise with your hands and breathing out. So just doing some really lovely deep and simple breaths can really help. And again, there is research to support this kind of thought process behind mindfulness and bringing it in because we're kind of stopping that, that fight or flight response. We're stopping that anxiety or that stress or those thoughts that are going, I'm waiting in the sign and when is this going to be done and maybe I'm not going to get through and what's going to happen and all that stuff can really ramp up and legit trigger your symptoms. So just by bringing yourself and centering yourself and grounding yourself in life every day for a few moments when you need it can really, really help. Now, our last story for today is all about onions. Now, if you are following any kind of dietary strategies to help your inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome, then you're probably avoiding onions. One, onions are high in FODMAPs and FODMAPs are uh, foods that have, well, FODMAPs are fermentable sugars that exist in different foods. So a lot of us have been starting to teach the low FODMAP diet. Actually, I've been teaching it for six years now and helping people kind of follow that for a very short term and then bring foods back in. Um, and so one of the foods that is very high in these very easily fermented sugars that is recommended you avoid, especially during the elimination phase, is onions. And even when you bring foods back in and you reintroduce them, you challenge them to figure out what your triggers are, in my experience, a lot of people have problems with onions. Excuse me, they're very high in, in FODMAPs and then they can really trigger symptoms. So a lot of my clients and a lot of my people are avoiding onions and if they have them in there in really small amounts. Now, pickled onions are an interesting topic. And what we've seen from Monash is as they test different kinds of foods, like different foods but from different countries or different versions of that foods, like sauerkraut versus cabbage. And now today, we want to talk about pickled onions. They're finding different amounts of FODMAPs in them. So FODMAP Friendly tweeted, Fact Friday, pickled onions are low FODMAP at 30 grams. If you're missing onions, try them. And then Monash published on their blog that large pickled onions are low in FODMAPs while small pickled onions are high in FODMAPs. Hmm, FODMAPs, you tricky guy, you. FODMAPs are tricky. <laughs> the best way to follow the low FODMAP diet is to join our program, the Clarity Program, or to work with a registered dietitian who really, really knows the low FODMAP diet. Now, I love my dietitians. They are my people. 
but not everyone is an expert in the low FODMAP diet and not everyone is an expert on digestive health. So make sure that you work with a dietitian who exclusively works with patients and clients with digestive health issues and you're going to have a real expert on your hand to help you stay up to date on all this stuff and then help you kind of follow the diet, eliminate foods and bring them back in or you are welcome. We would love you in our program, the Clarity Program. But these large darn pickled onions are low and small are high. Now that's very interesting and it makes you think like as foods get bigger is there more water content and perhaps there's actually less of those concentrated sugars. Remember FODMAPs are sugars that are very easily fermented and can trigger symptoms in the gut. So large pickled onions contain lower levels of fructans and that's that FODMAP that we're avoiding with onions and also garlic compared to the small ones. The small ones are higher in fructose as well. So another FODMAP. Some foods have multiple FODMAPs in them. So something about the canning process actually reduces these water-soluble fructans. Maybe some of those fructans come out in the water and then there's less. What do you think about that, guys? Should we eat some pickled onions? <laughs> so now remember, when you are working towards better digestion, better digestive health, a reduction and relief of symptoms, getting back to feeling normal. There are lots of different things that you can do. If you're feeling alone or isolated or worried or stressed out or depressed or beaten down because, damn, it's hard. <laughs> Some days can feel so hard. I'm with you. I've been there for four years. I suffered trying a million different things, and it wasn't until I put together a step-by-step -step plan implementing all the different kinds of strategies like that mind-gut connection, like those foods that are really good for your gut and actually help heal your gut, like avoiding the foods like FODMAPs for a short period of time to get really, really real relief and then starting to identify your triggers. I really believe that you need that step-by-step -step process of relief, then identifying your triggers, then long-term wellness to keep you well and feeling wonderful, my friend. So if you have any questions about Clarity, send me a personal message or anyone on the team here. You can also email us at info at stephanieclaremont.com. And for now, we know what could be triggering our symptoms. We know that breathing can help, so get working on that. And you can now have a little bit of a large pickled onion. Add that into the kinds of foods that you're eating. All right, my friend, I will see you again next week on our second episode of The Relief Report right back here on our Facebook page. All right, bye for now, guys. Have a great day.